great honor to get to be with you today. Uh, I mentioned over breakfast this morning with a, a few of your colleagues that this opportunity is for me a, a chance to reconnect with the meanings of what people do as it touches the reality of people's lives uh, throughout our country. And I uh, will and moved to get to be here over the course of the day and to be uh, inspired by what you do on a daily basis. What I'd like to do in the few minutes that we have is to share a few ideas that I've uh, gathered from having had the opportunity to listen to thousands of people's stories across sectors and across the world, uh, people who are trying to do a hard and important work uh, and, uh, and sometimes succeeding and oftentimes failing. And my work over the last 30 years in developing a way of thinking about leadership practice has been based on capturing lessons from those successes and failures. And I want to share a few of those with you today. First, to say a word about crisis. Uh, it's useful to think about crisis as having two phases. Uh, I started off my training in medicine. And every hospital has an emergency room. And the emergent or emergency phase, the acute phase of a crisis, has to be dealt with. But it's its own entity. And that's why we've seen in the field of medicine the growth of a whole specialization called emergency care, because it's sort of it's, its own practice area. And the practice area has two basic uh, goals to stabilize the patient and buy time to work the underlying problem. Uh, if you can't buy that time, if you lose the patient, then you lose the, the whole, you lose the whole ball game. So stabilizing the situation becomes absolutely critical. But again, you're doing it on behalf of buying yourself time to work the deeper questions, the deeper issues. Many times in the practice of leadership, people stabilize the situation and then they go back to sleep because they think the problem is solved because the acute crisis, the acute spike in urgency, what we could call this orange line, the spike in disequilibrium, is resolved. It's resolved because we've applied our immediate know-how to restore or at least bring the level of disequilibrium, distress, confusion, pain, uh, down uh, low enough so that, so that people can move on to other things. And everyone in life has got a lot of different problems on their plate. And so when you bring the, uh, when you succeed in stabilizing the situation in the emergency phase, you run the risk of doing such a good job that people just move on to the next issue but never really address the underlying adaptive dimensions of the challenge that gave rise to the crisis in the first place. So it's critical in thinking about the, uh, a, a crisis to be able to see both the danger, the danger is in the emergency phase that you can lose the, you can lose the patient, but also see that the, there is opportunity in the crisis in drawing attention to and beginning to frame the adaptive challenges that become uh, in focus as a product of the crisis. Now, you might have known about these adaptive dimensions of the problem, these underlying challenges for a long, long time. But getting other people more broadly to pay attention is frequently one of your primary sources of frustration. So the crisis provides an opportunity to galvanize larger network attention to the critical questions that you've been trying to get people to address for a long time. And in that sense, crises can even be manufactured as a means of drawing attention to underlying issues. Certainly when they happen unmanufactured by this or that sudden event, uh, the harnessing of that energy, that harnessing of that disequilibrium to sustain adaptive work over time becomes, I think, the major focus of leadership. So I begin by saying that there are these two phases. And the acute phase is critical, but 
the major goal in the acute phase is to use the urgency to draw attention to and mobilize commitment to working the underlying problems that are going to require a lot more difficult and indeed a lot more frequently painful and disruptive work. One more word about the acute phase. The acute phases are important, and many of you are dealing with the acute phase every single day because in children's services, family services, there are emergencies every single day. Bad things happen to people, and you're there, in a sense, like the emergency room to deal with that emergency crisis. That's why you have beds, many of your agencies. It's to deal with, with those emergent conditions. Your presence in reducing the level of disequilibrium, in calming people down so that the level of disturbance is uh, brought into a productive range, your presence in stabilizing and calming people and reducing panic becomes absolutely essential. And the development of the emergency procedures and the, the um, swiftness and the clarity with which those procedures can be implemented is also critical because the action itself calms people down and reduces the disequilibrium into a productive range. It's like cooking in a pressure cooker. You don't want the pressure cooker to blow up. But if there's not sufficient pressure, nothing will cook. So your job, in a way, is to regulate the level of disequilibrium, to bring it down into a productive range, but not bring it down so low that the work stops. In that sense, then, you have to go against, many times, our natural inclination, which is to comfort people, in order to keep people in an ongoing state of discomfort, but a productive state of discomfort, where they feel stimulated to continue to work the problem rather than complacent that the problem has gone away. If you make the mistake of stabilizing the situation so successfully that everybody else goes to sleep, then you will be stuck with agencies that only provide emergency services and do not begin to address the larger underlying adaptive challenges facing the community as a whole challenges of education, challenges of taxation, challenges of economic development, challenges of, that involve uh, the judicial system and the police, uh, challenges that fall across many, many boundaries uh, in order to tackle the, the life in which families and children, uh, the world in which they exist. OK. So in adaptive work, in a crisis, we have the opportunity to focus on these three basic essential questions. Very tough questions. What DNA are we going to keep? What's good and productive in what we're doing already? What losses do we have to sustain? Changes in the way we currently operate? And what innovation will enable us to take the best of our history and tradition into the future. Many people who are change agents, many people who conceive of themselves as leadership, focus only on the change, but they don't focus on what's going to be conserved. In nature, we know that highly transformative changes are highly conservative. 99% of your DNA and my DNA is identical to a chimpanzee. It only takes 1% change to give us extraordinary functionality compared to a chimpanzee. And chimpanzees are already amazing creatures. The most successful changes anchor themselves and build from the local culture of a family or of a community, uh, the, the social infrastructure that exists already, the language, the grammar, the tradition, the values, the competencies that exist already, and they start with where people are at and they build from there. Revolutions almost always fail because they don't anchor themselves in the culture of the community as it is. 
As the consulting industry knows, when you parachute into an environment and you simply try to graft some best practice from a foreign place into a new place, the graft will often not take. Because to weave it in, to feather it in, to thread it in, to have it grow from that local soil um, is much harder and much more sustaining and much more political work. In the process of then identifying what to conserve, one inspires people. Because the inspiration that comes from meaning comes from being able to speak to the values that will be conserved, the values that are enduring, the love, the care, the community. All of these words are highly uh, evocative words because they represent a whole host of values that are essential to people. People don't want to throw out the baby with the bathwater. They want to know what they're going to be able to hold on to in the process of change. So those of you who are leading change across boundaries have to not only speak enthusiastically about the new opportunities, the new programmatic ideas, but also have to speak about what, your, what these new innovations will allow people to hold on to from the past so that the losses are contextualized. Your agencies can provide the innovative laboratories that frequently governments can't provide. Government officials are critical to your world because in every community there are agencies that serve, that provide services across many different kinds of boundaries that are essential to you accomplishing your task of building healthier environments for children and families. But these officials are constrained because public opinion sometimes will not value failed experiments. And a public official who stands up and says, you know, we, uh, we ran 15 new projects and seven failed, eight succeeded, will get attacked, will risk their job. But you can afford to, to run experiments, to succeed and fail. You can get funding that enables you to run this pilot program and that, to tinker and experiment. You can become the laboratory in which changed and new ideas are developed, which then need to be seeded into the political environment by crossing boundaries. So leadership requires then the capacity to take the, start with the problem at the center, which is the, the health of children and families, and to work the whole stakeholding community around that child. From teachers in schools and then the school system itself to police in the community and the policing community and the judicial community around to the business sector that provides jobs to and so forth. And if we then do a proper stakeholder analysis, your job becomes highly political. Political not in the crude sense of simply trafficking in power, but political in the real sense of looking through people at the constituencies that each represents. And understanding that when you pull people together, when you go talk to this person in that community who represents that faction, this police person, this educating person, this government person, each in their world represents their own world and speaking into their world and figuring out how to create linkages and alliances across those worlds so that you're all facing the problem collectively and can figure out how to innovate collectively to develop new adaptive capacity. That becomes your job. All too often, people get captured by the emergency demands of simply keeping your agency afloat. And all of this cross-boundary work doesn't really get done. People with the hearts of gold end up spending too much time complaining about the constraints in the environment rather than ripening the environment so that the constrained individuals in other organizations have an easier time with their own constituencies making headway. <clears throat> 
Whenever you find yourself personalizing a complaint in the form of, if only Joe would, you're making a diagnostic mistake. You have to look through Joe and see that he's constrained by a world. And part of your job then is to make the world easier for Joe to move forward and work in a problem that if, if he had that freedom, he would want to do. OK, let me close then with a word about staying alive. You stay alive in your heart and soul for a lifetime, knowing that your work will take lifetimes, that you can't measure good, that though you measure things every single day, ultimately you can't measure the good of what you do. It says in my religious tradition, the Jewish tradition, if you save one life, you save the world. When you turn the lights on behind one child's eyes, you can't measure that. I think living in a world of measurement, we all tend to buy into the myth of measurement and think that it's not good enough if we can't scale it up. I think scaling it up is absolutely important. But it doesn't mean that there isn't good beyond measure that you're doing every day in turning the lights on behind this child's eyes or helping this parent figure out how to love more effectively every single day. And I hope that one of the ways your alliance can help you stay in the game through the despair that inevitably will accompany your jobs is to remind each other of the good that you're doing that's beyond any measure. May the force be with you. Thank you very much, Ron. That, that was very good. Uh, I am I'm struck by the idea that we have to go through Joe to go to the uh, circumstances that surround him, family, and uh, you know, the, the entire environment that influences his crisis. Uh, and that uh, is something that we're really buying into these days, too. That's a reason why we renamed our organization Alliance for Strong Families and Communities, because we recognize, as you say, the, the inseparability of those things together. So uh, that, that, that was really really struck me. Um, a question I, I wanted to pull at one thread that you, you talked about early on in your presentation that I thought was fascinating. Um, you mentioned the idea of manufacturing the crisis so that you can uh, shine light on the underlying problem so that you can mobilize uh, leadership and, and adapt for change. Have you, can you say a little bit more about that? Have you, is there an example you can point to or um, just a little bit more about how you manufacture the crisis and yet control it at the same time? Well, someone in your position who's, you know, in part in charge of, you know, you do development, right? Um, I mean, you can manufacture crisis anytime you want by saying we got a budget problem. And, and when you say we got a budget problem... We have you, a budget problem. You know, you immediately draw people's attention to this fundamental strategic challenge, clarifying your identity, clarifying what are you going to keep doing, what are you going to stop doing, figuring out what cultural DNA will you keep, but what are you going to discard? And then what innovation will enable you to take the best of what you want to keep being into the future? So you know, a budget crisis is a annual opportunity for a country, for a country, for a company, or for a nonprofit organization to work its fundamental strategic challenge. Now companies and organi nonprofit organizations and governments avoid strategic work all the time. They'll do a salami cutter, you know, 10% across the board, rather than having to work the much harder question of what to do more of and what to do less of. Mm -hmm. Those strategic questions involve losses, and people have difficulty distributing losses, and therefore they have difficulty being strategic about what they're doing. So crises can be engineered at the organizational level, but at the social level, the civil rights movement was the in the 1960s was really the instrumentation of crisis. These were artificial crises. People would, dem would look for a community where uh, the police could be provoked into a brutal response. Sometimes they'd make the mistake of picking a community where the police would outsmart them by not reacting, like in Albany, Georgia, 
where you would love them to death. That was the, that was the police attitude. We'll love them to death, and it'll fizzle out. But when they got really good at identifying which uh, community was most likely to get provoked into brutal response, like in Selma, you know, they would keep demonstrating. And finally, they found a way to provoke. And as long as they stayed disciplined, it drew public attention, national attention. You had to make sure the cameras were there. Mm -hmm. So that the brutality of racism, which was latent all the time, would now be surfaced so that people around the country would have to face the internal contradiction in America. That we say we, we, say we stand for, for freedom and equal opportunity, but actually, that's not how we're living. So drawing people to these, in, these contradictions and values frequently requires a crisis. People don't want to have to face those internal contradictions, those hypocrisies. So sometimes a crisis is manufactured. Sometimes it's given to you. Ferguson is, a, is, is an event. It could have simply gone back to sleep. You know, uh, It's not rare that an innocent person is murdered you know, because he does a petty crime, probably, mm -hmm. and then there's overreaction by the police. But in this case, falling on the, uh, you know, the, the Trayvon Martin and various things having happened over the last years, you have a, a group of people who say, we're going to continue to use this uh, crisis as a way to galvanize generalized attention to ripen a set of concerns so that people don't go back to sleep and go back to business as usual. Ripening means where the urgency becomes generalized across factions in that stakeholding group, rather than being localized where the only people who are really urgent and passionate about it are us. Mm -hmm. How do you generalize the urgency so that other people uh, can begin to uh, have that problem appear on their own radar screen? And that's where crises then become galvanic and important strategic opportunities. I've, I've never thought about it that way, and that's, that's great insight. And of course, we have our conference. Uh, this conference will be in St. Louis next year. So maybe we have an opportunity to, to draw some attention to the underlying adaptive uh, crisis that uh, needs to happen there as well. So again, thank you pleasure. very much. For Real pleasure. Thank you.